Thank you. Welcome back. We hope you have enjoyed the tea break. We will be continuing with our third speaker for today to give us an overview of the common differences between China and Singapore accounting standards. Mr. Lim Li Ming, senior partner of RSM Chiu Lim LLP, currently heads the China practice group of the firm. Outside his profession, Mr. Lim is the independent director of six listed companies in Singapore, three of which he is serving as a chairman of the audit committee. He is also a board member of the Casino Regulatory Authority of Singapore. We will now invite Mr. Lim to make his presentation. Let's give him a round warm welcome. Thank you. Okay, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So after tea break, I hope you are more refreshed. And today is a Friday. All of us like to go back early. So keep it short and sweet. Actually, <clears throat> in life, uh, a lot of, sometimes a lot of things we have to make adjustment or reconciliation in accounting terms. Uh, just now before the seminar, I was talking to my, uh, what I call the speakers from China. I uh, was saying that, hey, the English they speak is more American accent. And then Singapore will be more of uh, a British accent. But my colleague promptly corrected and said, no, we speak Singlish. They speak PRC English. <laughs> so end up with the reconcile. Similarly, for accounting standards, uh, though the world is looking towards conversion of accounting standards towards IFRS, uh, but you still find differences and you still have to do a lot of reconciliations. So, for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to touch on the commonly found differences between PRC and Singapore accounting standards. Now, the PRC standards, as uh, Mr. Chen, Chen Yiwei uh, was explaining uh, just now, there are two types, the old gaps and the new gaps. Uh, China new gaps are actually applicable mostly to the Yang Qi, that means the century uh, control, Zhong Yang Qi uh, companies. And also to their lease score, uh, but for FIE, foreign uh, investor in China, and also for their small and medium enterprises, they are still using the old gaps. So in fact, China, a lot of this reconciliation required because uh, a lot of time in Singapore, we are actually holding the investment in China. So in Singapore, we are almost all, we are all actually uh, FRS uh, uh, compliance, and, but in China, if your subsidiary is using the old gap, then that's where a lot of reconciliation Reconciliation is needed. Oh. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's have a quick look <clears throat> at the uh, China accounting standard for business enterprise. Basically, they, as explained by Mr. Chen, they have 38 standards. Uh, most, most of them actually can find a similar equivalent uh, SFRS. I shall not go through one by one in order not to waste your time. Let's take a quick look at do. Let's walk through this. Okay. So all together, you can see there are 30 of them. And for every standard they have, we can find an equivalence uh, or similar standard uh, in SFRS or IFRS. Now the Singapore financial reporting standard uh, without corresponding accounting standards for business enterprises uh, in China. Uh, basically the FRS 29, financial reporting in hyperinflationary economies, which is quite, not quite relevant to us. Like. Fortunately, our inflation is always under control, below 3% or thereabouts. And for FRS 105, the non-current assets held for sales and discontinued operations. This is uh, part of the disclosure that as a practitioner, sometimes we actually missed out yeah, to, to, to comply with the standard and classify accordingly. Uh, in China, there's no such standard yet. So in fact, uh, for this one, you have to be careful if you're practicing auditors. <coughs> Uh, when your client is consolidating their subsidiaries in China into Singapore accounts, uh, you do have to be mindful or inquire whether their assets or subsidiaries in China actually actually are already assets held for sales or basically are discontinued operations. Then you have to adjust and make sure it's complied uh, with 105 for your group accounts. Now let's look at a quick visit of the key differences between ASRB, the China, China Gap, and the Singapore FRS. 
Now, as far as the uh, revaluation of assets is concerned, uh, ASB 4 and 6 only allow the cost model for measurement of fixed assets and intangible assets. Whereas for SFRIs uh, 16 and uh, 38, 16 is for PPE, 38 is for intangible assets, it, uh, they allow uh, both the cost and revaluation re model. Yeah? So this is the uh, uh, basic difference. Now, as far as the impairment of assets is concerned, ASB 8 prohibits the reversal of all impairment losses for assets covered by these standards. That's to say, once you make impairment, you cannot reverse. That's uh, the China uh, gap. Whereas for SRF 36, it only prohibits the reversal of impairment of goodwill. So this is one of the key differences. Now, what about land use rights? In China, this is always an uh, uh, item that uh, comes to accounting, auditing, treatment, always gives a fair bit of headache, so-called. Because in China, uh, the, under ASB 6, land use rights, uh, that this is classified as intangible assets, unless it meets the criteria for classification as investment property under ASB number 3. Now, in fact, in China, it's not only the classification question. When you're dealing with land use rights, always be very careful that they have the titles. Because in China, to transfer a land use right titles, sometimes it takes years. Why it takes so many years to transfer and yet not transfer? Because in China, when you transfer land, land use rights, or in short land, there's always this uh, capital gain tax that you have to account for. And unfortunately, in China, over the past few years, the property prices has gone up so much that a lot of companies are holding back the transfer, hoping that the bubble will burst and then the, the, the tax will come down. But somehow it doesn't happen. So you can see even in Lisco companies, uh, the, the uh, PRC companies who are listed in Singapore, very often in the notes or even in the audit opinions, uh, there will be special mention about this land use right transfer is still pending, etc. The other problem with land use right in China is that in certain cities like Dongguan, those are cities where a lot of lands were converted from farmland to commercial land. And somehow in China, uh, I was told, maybe our guest speaker from China can clarify later, is that every city or every province is given certain quota to transfer or convert uh, farmland to uh, or agricultural land to commercial use. Once they use up the quota for the year, they cannot transfer anymore. They got to wait. So in, in cities like Dongguan, in fact, they use up many years already. They got to wait a long, long time. Yeah. So as far as uh, I think for accountant, not so bad. It's your land use right, it's your land use right. Make sure that your title is protected yeah, legally. But for auditors, I think we have to be very careful. Yeah. If they are not transferred, you better mention in the notes or in your audit opinion. Otherwise, uh, when APRA comes for inspection, that will be a hot spot. Yeah. Now, under SFRS 17, uh, that is our standard. Leasehold land is classified as PPE unless it meets the criteria for classification as investment property under SRS 4D. Yeah? And for, in fact, if under IFRS, the International FRS, land use rights is recognized as prepaid operating lease, and then you amortize uh, thereafter. What about joint ventures? Joint ventures for uh, SRS 31, it allows a venturer to choose equity method or proportionate consolidation method to account for its interest in the joint venture. Whereas for the uh, China Gap, they only allows the equity method, but not the proportionate consolidation method. But interesting enough uh, to share with you is that for IASB, uh, ASB Exposure Draft ED9 on joint arrangement that was published uh, in September 2007. Uh, the Exposure Draft actually provides that a venturer should recognize its interest in joint venture using the equity method. The, the final standard uh, of uh, this uh, of ED9 is expected to be released by AS, IASB uh, in Q4 this year. That, that's the next, few, next two months or so. So in fact, one, uh, this one become a standard, uh, then basically uh, quite, uh, quite uh, aligned with uh, ESB. 